Okay, thank you, Steve. Okay, I will um, give a talk this morning that I actually gave at Semtech. Um, and in this talk, well, usually when I give talks, and I see that uh, about half the people that are logged in have seen my earlier talks, but most of my talks I did, do demos and uh, go in technical detail. Today I'll stay a little bit more to service and talk more about the business aspects and about questions that I normally get about triple stores. So it's a little bit more from a vendor perspective. If you try um, to get triple stores in the enterprise, um, but it also might help people in the audience that are um, already convinced that they want to play or actually work with triple stores, but they need to convince their colleagues or bosses that it's a, uh, that this is a technology that you can do something with. So I'm going to talk about these questions today. Um, and we actually get these almost every day. First one is, can you explain more about triples and metadata and uh, what the difference is between a relational database and a triple store? Then everyone always wants to know what other companies use triple stores for and why these companies use triple stores. And then a new thing that comes up when we um, are interacting with people that are interested in triple stores is to say, well, but can't I do that with uh, NoSQL databases? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then I will talk about general requirements for relational database triple stores and big data. And I kind of will argue that there are a number of natural applications for each of these for each of these databases. And then I go a little bit self-serving, and then I will talk about what is so special about our triple store, Allegro Graph. And finally, I will conclude with, uh, can I scale to a trillion triples a trillion triples, and what do I have to do for that? So I will talk a little bit about our roadmap and what we're doing right now to get to the triple, triple uh, to the trillion triple challenge. And then finally, for people that are hanging all the way to the end, I want to show you one uh, exciting demo of a new thing that we developed in our lab. It's a completely new visual query editor, and so this is a thing that will allow you to make Sparkle queries without typing anything. And um, it's already downloadable from our website, and it's a really new, exciting technology. Let's get into the questions. So the first question that we get is, um, can you explain more about triples and metadata? And um, what I've found so far, that if you want to talk to other people about metadata, then obviously you can point to W3C and, and uh, all kinds of stories about what people use um, RDF for. But this book called Pool by David Siegel is actually a really great book to, because it gives you um, endless number of examples of how the industry will change if we manage to put metadata on nearly everything that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then if you really want to get into triples, I found so far that the book by Dean Alamang and Jim Handler is actually a, a, a really great book for people to get into RDF, um, how you do, uh, how do you make simple ontologies, and how with even a little bit of reasoning, you already can do far more than you could do with relational databases. And it gives some nice examples of how you can um, use, for example, semantic web technology for database integration. So I'm not going to say much more about this because um, looking at the list of people that logged in, most of, the, most of you are already familiar with triples and metadata. Then the other question I get all the time is, um, so what is the difference between a relational database and a triple store? Most of the time when you uh, talk to customers about um, using triple stores, you usually talk to a large group of people that are already completely familiar with relational databases by IBM, Oracle. And they kind of um, feel that they can do whatever they want to do with a relational database, which most of the cases is actually true. So what I then do to um, talk about this is I take the simple um, kind of an artist impression of a database for people. So say you want to um, make a database, and one of the elements of the database is a person, and you want to represent, well, um, the, well the, the, the most important data, the first name, last name, etc then people will have had multiple spouses in their life sometimes, or went to multiple schools, or 
have multiple professions, and most of the time have multiple children. So before you know it, you have a schema with at least seven, eight tables just for the person in your database. Um, with a triple store, it's completely different. Basically, you take the same, same information, and you just dump it in simple triples. So every cell in your database becomes a triple in a triple store. And um, the big differences are you don't have to make a schema up front, although you could. And we call these schemas then uh, ontologies. And the other thing is that one to many relationships are directly encoded. So a lot of joins that you normally have in the database are already done up front. So that's about the difference between relational database and triple stores. And then triple stores are especially good in pattern recognition and graph search. And so what you see is because you don't have to make schema, people can put much more complex relationships in databases. And so here's your tool that I will show you later, where you see kind of the graph nature of the data that you get when you put your data into a triple store. And so please don't try to read this, this slide. We'll get back to this database uh, at the uh, end of uh, this talk. So then the question is, what do companies use triple stores for? Or what companies do use triple stores? And um, here's a bunch of customers that have been with us for a number of years now. Um, most of them all, well, they all have bought the uh, Allegro Graph 3.3. And most of them are now going to 4.0. And what you see is kind of a mix between um, pharmaceutical industry, for example, GlaxoSmithKline is a great project where they did competitive analysis between various uh, companies, uh, Eli Lilly, uh, Novartis. We have a bunch of uh, DOD integrators like Raytheon and Boeing, and of course DOD itself. Uh, we have some media companies like Adobe and Kodak. So. It's not that it's for one particular industry, but it's kind of everywhere. Oh, and I forgot the, the telecom industry, but I'll talk about it in a second. So here are some current projects that we're doing. Um, for example, the, uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, one of the biggest cancer centers in the world, probably the biggest, is contemplating a, a big semantic web, web platform to combine the information of all the doctors that they have and do analysis on those records. So instead of having all these doctors doing stuff on an individual basis, um, they try to uni make it uniform and unify it so you can do much more interesting and effective um, research into, for example, the health effects of particular drugs or particular uh, treatments. Um, We've done database integration with Pfizer, and that project is still going on. Hoover's is a very, very interesting example uh, where they have databases with almost all the companies in the world, and about um, five, 6,000 of them. They have enormous amount of information. But for the other millions and millions of companies, there's not that much information, and they're trying to automate the acquisition of information about that and to explore the big social networks uh, between companies. Uh, so, and when I talk about social networks, I mean that companies have competitive relationships. They have people that worked at one company, they went to the other company. People have uh, companies have products or types of products that are also made by other companies. And so, if you think of it, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful graph. You can do all kinds of interesting analysis on that. And then um, I won't go into the DoD part, but you can imagine how they want to use this technology. And then our biggest customer right now is MDocs, who is actually helping us to get to a, a trillion triples. They have an, a very, very interesting service where um, they take the day-to-day -day events in the telecom and abstract triples out of that. And that allows them to know everything that there is to know about a particular customer. So the problem that the current telecom companies right now have is that um, every time if you call to a call center to ask something about your phone or your, or your new smartphone, then actually the telecom company is losing money. Yeah? And they've shown that if you call into a call center, 
then on average your call center operator looks at about 60 screens. <clears throat> and wouldn't it be great if you, when you, a customer calls up, you already know exactly what his customer is, what his problems are, and what he's most likely to going to call about. So they created um, what they call a guided interactive advisor, which is um, based on, on top of a triple store where everything about the customer stored there and, and, and brought up when uh, the call center operator takes your call. Anyway, there's other talks that we do about this, so let's not go too deep. Um, then, why do all these companies work with triple stores? And um, so I, I now ask people when they work with the triple store what they think about it, what they like about it, what they dislike about it, and I always ask what is the most important reason that you use a triple store? And by far the, uh, uh, well, the answer that I get most of the time is, actually almost all of the time, is ultimate flexibility, yeah? If you don't know beforehand how your database is going to look like, and if you knew it, you've got thousands and thousands of things that you want to model, and the, the schemas are just too complicated, then triple stores will offer you the flexibility. Um, if you add classes every day, or if you add new features to things every day, yeah, or if you need to work with rules and reasoning, then only triple stores will give you that flexibility. The second answer I get is uh, linkability. Yeah? Um, more than half of the people that use triple stores, well, I can only talk about the Lego Graph triple stores, is they use it for almost ad hoc integration of databases. You have a bunch of data sources, and there are a lot of links between them, but you don't want to go the entire route of uh, master data management. There will trickle doors. With triple stores, you can kind of slowly and more easily get into integration by just taking parts of the various triple stores and unifying them through a triple store. Um, well, these, those are the most important answers, and I could go in the other ones too. Uh, let me go in the last part. So about the other half of our customers, and MDocs was one of the examples that I just talked about, use triple stores to store events, where events are defined as things that have uh, types. So you've got types of events, like a telephone call, or uh, an email, or a financial transaction. You've got so, um, actors in an event, people that talk to each other or send money to each other. Um, and things always happen at a particular time, a particular place. And um, we deal with it with our triple store. And it's one of the things I will talk about again later this talk. Now, the question that comes up when we talk to uh, customers is, or potential customers, hey, why can't I use a NoSQL database for this? And I guess that most of you in the audience already did a little bit of studying of NoSQL about Hadoop and HBase and Cassandra. And I'm actually not even going to explain it. Um, there's wonderful descriptions on the web for what they are. Uh, of course, they're all distributed. They all run on stock hardware, and they basically can do as much data as you want. There's no limit. It's basically only a mono, money limit about how much data you can store. And the one thing I want you to note is that these things sacrifice assetness and complex joints for web scale scalability. So now it's it's interesting that I get these queries. So I did a little bit of study on, the, on Google Trends. And here you see that. Um, how much people currently like to talk about various technologies. So if you <clears throat> go to Google Trends and you talk about relational database, then you see that over time uh, you get down less than one for how much people talk about relational databases. Now, obviously, 99% of all money is in this particular area, but it's just not hip anymore to write about it. Yeah, Triple stores, well, you can see they started getting onto the radar roughly in 2007. And they're far more hip to write about than um, relational databases. But no SQL databases, man, that is uh, an interesting topic. It's about 30 times as interesting as a relational database to talk about. So many blogs and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, I don't know, if you look at the statistics, you actually see that's going down again. But that's probably just a temporary phenomenon. So anyway. <clears throat> That explains a little bit why I get this question all the time. Hey, why not use um, NoSQL for what you want to do? So 
I was kind of forced to come up with a story there. And, well, the first part is that I think that there are a number of um, natural applications for each type of database. Yeah? If you take Oracle or IBM or Postgres or MySQL, you talk about relational databases, then they kind of fit into the regular enterprise applications. These are applications where it's really important that it's as it, that it's really important that your data is 100% safe um, and um, and if you make mistakes with your day-to-day, -day, then it could be big, big losses for the company. So relational databases belong in here. And the big data databases are basically only employed, well, mostly employed when on the web for the big uh, gorillas on the web, like Amazon and Yahoo and Google. Um, and these people have to deal with billions and billions and billions of objects, yeah? Uh, but most of the time, it's just shallow objects. You just get one object back, back with all the features of that object. So there's a little bit of joints in these objects already. Uh, but you never do a big join over these things. But you don't need to. And these architectures will allow you to do basically unlimited number of objects. And then you have triple stores that work for if you have really complex metadata applications. Yeah, So it's kind of natural. Although, of course, everyone claims that you can do the other thing too. Uh, so relational databases say they have this new clustering technology so that you can really do web scale uh, uh, objects. You don't need these big data things. And the big data people like Hadoop and Cassandra say they can also do complex metadata applications. And then triple store people say that they can do everything else too. Yeah? So you see a kind of attention, but I still hold that these are the most natural um, classes or well, the mapping between the type of database and, and class of application. Um, and so I also made some graphics and uh, where I try to compare on some other features that people want in the enterprise. And I'm talking here about relational database. HBase is one um, of the, 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 the big data databases. That's the one that we actually play with here at France. And then here the average triple store. Um, and Allegro Graph 3.3 I also count into the average triple store. Now, obviously, you already understand this is a dirty marketing picture because I'll add, later add 4.0 to this. Let's talk about this. So only relational databases are of you the full asset part. Um, the HBase people are working on it, and the average triple store actually doesn't do it. Then relational databases and, and these stores are really good at uh, concurrent access. Uh, triple stores are still far too static. Random access in all these things relatively good, but triple stores give you the full flexibility, far more flexibility than all the other ones. But if you're in the enterprise, I mean, nowadays we see every time when we talk to people, people want to know about high availability. And the average triple store doesn't add it, and um, these databases obviously do. But then again, they can do very complex graph search, and triple stores can. Triple stores are also by far the best in dealing with combinations of structured and structured. And, but these ones are, again, better in scalability. Yeah? So this is kind of a picture of where we are right now. Um, but I'll present this picture again later. So now a little bit self-serving. What is so special about your triple store? Well, I like a graph is a... Um, a scalable and persistent triple store. Um, actually, we're a quad store. I don't think there's any triple store right now that only does triples. They all do now do a subject, predicate, object, and the context argument. And um, I think a few of them now can actually store billions of triples on a single machine. Uh, Lego Graph is federated, so you can have on one machine or on multiple machines a bunch of databases and then you make one abstract database that points to the other ones, and you can do your Sparkle prolog and reasoning against your federated store without worrying where your triples come from. Obviously, that works better if your database is all, all on the same machine, but it's still good when it's against multiple machines. Um, we're compliant with all standards. Um, we spend a lot of effort to make sure that we get the same efficiency as relational databases for range queries. 
Um, and then what we added to the database is, uh, and that's fairly unique, is if you encode in your RDF uh, latitude longitudes, we'll make sure that you get, you can do very fast spatial search, both proximity, like find all the events that happened within five miles of Berkeley. Um, we also add a temporal reasoning. So if you have events with the time, then we'll allow you to do efficient reasoning about time. And we have a very extensive social network analysis library on top of this. Um, and then, as I said before, um, in Lego Graph, we, um, a lot of our customers use a triple store as an event database, where, as I said before, events have a type. You see here a bunch of types, a list of actors, uh, almost most of the time and place, um, start time, end time, and then a lot of other things that describe the events. And we make that all available in one query language. So we can do this query like find all the meetings that happened in November within five months of Berkeley that was attended by the most important person, the Janssen's friends, events of friends. And here you see the same query, the prologue, where um, you see that the first two classes are social network analysis classes. And you get a database lookup, a little bit of RDFS++ reasoning, because you talk about types of events. And then you talk about a time interval and a space interval. Yeah? So this is a very powerful capability to have. And then um, some new elements in the Lego Graph 4.0. It's uh, actually a totally new database with a new storage layer. We've been uh, using it in beta for a year, and we um, let it out in the open um, about two months ago now. And in this database, is completely asset. We provide commits and rollbacks, checkpointing, full and fast recoverability. Um, you never have to, to think about indexing anymore. There's no indexing phase. Everything is always indexed. Um, you can have hundreds of uh, clients talking to the database at the same time. Now, of course, if they all do hard queries, it will slow down. But at least you can have hundreds to thousands um, clients talking to the database and you get fair performance. We provide hot backups, and we now do replication. Very important in the, in the database world. Um, and then some other things. We now finally remove duplicate triples. Um, you can choose whether you do it insert time, slows down your insert, or we do it later uh, when we optimize the, the indices in the background. And then a unique point, when we delete triples, our database does not get bigger, but it actually gets smaller. Most triple stores delete triples, but they only mark for delete. We now delete, and we really garbage collect them later on. So these are the features, and then going back. So again, with AG 4.0, we now are asset like a relational database. We do the concurrency, um, and we now also provide the high availability. So for us, this has been an enormous step forward. Um, so what is the performance of this? Well, right now we um, load a Lubum 8000. Uh, for the people who don't know what Lubum is, it's, um, it's the benchmark that all the vendors of triple stores use. Um, it basically is an ontology of what a university is, so with the different types of uh, students, professors, classes, organizations, uh, papers, patents, and whatever. And you can make as many universities as you want, and each university has about 20 uh, departments. Anyway, you get, uh, uh, I think, about 7,000 triples per university. Anyway, the point of this is that uh, on a, a machine with 32 gig of memory, four disks, four cores, and we index uses the main dishes, SPOBI and POSGI, we can load all the 14, all the data, and do all the Lumen queries in two hours and 25 minutes. And we, there's no pre-processing pre of strings, no indexing phase, no materialization. Just in two hours and 25 minutes, you're totally done, which is, uh, as far as I believe, still by far the fastest in the industry. Um, and some other data, we now do Lumen 40,000, um, which is 5.5 billion triples. Sorry, so Lubum 8000 is 1.1 billion triples. Lubum 40,000 is 5.5 billion triples on a 48 gig machine in 17 hours. So um, again, 
uh, I would say, really, really fast. But Lobum is a benchmark that's kind of, um, well, everyone accepts it's a good benchmark, but it's kind of getting a little bit boring. And what we see is also that in the industry and the enterprise, people find it far more important that they actually can add triples and delete triples and do queries all at the same time, even if you have a billion triples already loaded. Now, most triple stores kind of work in three phases, uh, sometimes even four. First, you kind of assign unique IDs to the strings in the triples, then you load the triples, then you do indexing, then you do materialization, and then you can do your queries. But in the enterprise, you really want um, simultaneous and parallel um, activity. And so we're proposing a new benchmark. Um, we call it the events test benchmark where we uh, want to measure how good a database is in adding, deleting, and querying triples at the same time after the first X million triples have been added. And um, so in our tests right now, is a, on a daily basis, we load up 2 billion triples and then start a cycles of adding, deleting, and queries. And we make these benchmarks public. The first version of this is uh, on GitHub, um, but we're working on follow-up ones. But anyway, if you want to look at look at it and try it out, just go to hit GitHub and search for events test and you get to uh, uh, this thing here. Then the question I get, can I do a trillion? <coughs> well, what I say always there is loading a trillion is actually just a matter of how much money you have. Yeah, you can just uh, load triple stores on a thousand machines and then you have to do only a billion per machine. Uh, but the real issue is loading query, uh, doing queries really fast. Um, and by queries, I don't mean just add, as asking information about one particular subject, but I mean also doing joins fast. I mean, that is the hardest part. And we're working with a big group of people here at France to especially work on doing fast queries over distributed databases. Um, so on the roadmap we have well, we now do work regularly with 20 billion triples on a big blade machine. Um, we expect a trillion triples in December. Um, and the, the hard parts are to keep it acid, because that's a requirement that our customers have. Um, we spend a lot of time on partitioning schemes, and we're looking like what Cassandra is doing there and other big data databases. Um, we look at the big data people for how they do smart balancing, and we're coming up with our own schemes. Um, indexing is another thing. I mean, uh, if you're on one machine, indexing is easy. But how do you do indexing if your data is spread over multiple machines? So this is a, yet another one. And then we work on query pipelines. So if you normally look at the query execution in the single store, then queries are mostly in Sparkle or Prolog or depth first. But if you want to do efficient queries, uh, on distributed stores, then you kind of have to go to a breadth first execution of queries, where you try to do queries as much as you can in parallel, so you get close to the MapReduce uh, paradigm. Anyway, so we're employing some of the MapReduce paradigm in the way we do our queries, and we look a lot also into um, methods where instead of doing the queries um, in one place, and but get the data from another place, is in many cases, you can do parts of the query on one machine totally. So you send part of the bindings of your queries and the whole query to another machine for the final execution. Um, so that's what we have in research. And then um, I want to end for the people that hang in there. I think most of the people are still in there. Um, <clears throat> let's do a little bit of a demo. Um, because I hate doing presentations where I only talk. Let me show you the latest version of Gruff. Um, so I don't know if people have seen this interface before. Some people might be new to it. So let me go to um, the Graph view. Um, so what I've loaded here, so I can go to File, and I have a, pr a number of uh, databases preloaded. So one that I don't uh, preloaded is gov.db. It's a database that comes originally from Psyche. I think most people have heard of Psyche, the biggest ontology, common sense ontology in the world. They created an IDF version, 
and added a whole bunch of information about um, uh, terrorist groups and weapon systems. Um, so I can, for example, look for something like Osama bin Laden. Um, and so I'm using the free text search in there. I get a lot of things. I could look at Al Qaeda. So I have Al Qaeda here. I can double click it. I get into the table view. Um, so you see some properties. So you see Al Qaeda is able to control uh, Taba investments. Al Qaeda is affiliated with Osama bin Laden. Um, so you see many, many properties all of um, Al Qaeda. I go back to the query view, hitting G. And I could say, um, well, <coughs> I can hit another letter, and what I see, the letter I, and I see some properties defined for this thing. So I could say, OK, what are the leaders? And what are the founders? Uh, what are the regions that you work in? And I hit the letter F. And then I get the expansion. Here to the left, you see the names of the predicates. And here you see the types of the various objects. So every type is a different color. And then I can keep on going. And I can uh, click on each of these things. Let me do select all. And I can kind of step by step explore the graph and go on and on and on. Now, we can also do queries here. And usually, you will have to write queries, Sparkle queries by hand. So I hit the letter W, and I get it to the query view. And I could say select star where, say, x, y, z. And I get the first 32 uh, queries. But I have to write. And most of the people, or some of the people in the audience, will have written Sparkle queries. And you will have found out how hard it is to come up with your namespaces, to get the full URIs for a particular node that you want to start with. You have to remember what predicates to use. Then you have to remember how to use particular filters. So it's kind of not easy to write Sparkle queries. And if you get into it, it's kind of, well, familiar. But then when you don't do it for a month, then you have to get into it again. So we created a tool. And what I'm going to show you with the tool is I'm going to do a query where I um, look at all the terrorist organizations that have leaders and founders where the leaders and the founders are not the same. And then I want to know all the properties of those leaders. Yeah? So let me start. So I'm looking for, say, I'm starting with Al-Qaeda. So now I have one node. And I say, OK, I want to find the leaders. So add a variable node leader. And um, I say, add a predicate link. And I can get all the predicates, the common predicates in the database. But here are the ones that are referenced for Al Qaeda. So I say, has leader. So now I have one part. And I also want to find the founder. So I say, well, add a variable node, founder. And um, give it a predicate link. So. Let's do a founding agent. So now I have a founding agent. And I could already do the query. And here what you see is I get a query. Give me every leader and founder where Al-Qaeda has a leader leader. And Al-Qaeda also has a founding agent founder. Yeah? And the system itself found the reference to Psyche. OK, go back to the query. And I say, I want the founder and the leader not to be the same. So we say, specify node filter. Oh, one second. Uh, add a filter link. So there's various ways I can look at this. I can say they have to be the same or not the same, uh, bigger or small or whatever. But I'm saying, OK, they're not the same. Um, and then I want to find all the properties of these leaders. So I say, well, let's take a. Variable node, say other, and then I say, well, I don't, I want all the things, so let's add a variable link. So we just say link here. So this time it's not, it's just a, here it was a constant, here's a variable, and um, oh yeah, and I also want to find all the terror organizations. So I click on Al Qaeda and I say, convert the variable with types. So make a new variable, and I say terror group. 
And now you see terror group is type terrorist group Islamist. So this is something that it got from Psyche. So now if I do the query, I see that um, it actually added a class for terror group. It's of RDF type site terror group Islamitic, Islamic, and the, and a filter that the founder is not the same as the leader. Yeah. Again, I did the query, and I can create official graph from the results. And here's the graph from this particular result. Yeah. For the query that we just did. But let's go back to the query view. Um, actually, I think I did most stuff. One one thing I can do, I can even do order by. So I want to order by terror group. And then, secondly, I want to order by leader. And so now I'm going to do a query again. I have order by classes, and things are ordered by name. So I guess that was all I wanted to show about the... Uh, all I wanted to do today, and um, let's open the floor for questions. Okay, thank you, Jans. There are a number of questions. Um, we'll start with the ones that have been queued up, and um, if you have other questions, now's the time to enter them in the question box. So, can you just define materialization if somebody's not familiar with that term? Okay, so um, the question is, well, yeah, the question is, what is materialization? So. Um, if you have a bunch of triples with an ontology in it, and some of the instances in your, say, some of the instances in your triple store have a type, then and type descriptions or constrictions on type, then when you ask for, say, does Jans have, what are the type of Jans? So the query would be Jans has type and then something, then the triple store has to do multiple steps in the database. It, it can look straight for triples if there maybe was a Jans is of RDF type human. So that was a direct lookup. But it also could be that um, there was a range restriction. So you say all the triples that have a first name, have a first name, sorry, all the, the, um, the all the, the subjects that have, um, the predicate first name must be of type human. So the triple store will also look at the range restriction to see whether you're a human or not. Then you can look at the domain descriptions, and there's many more other things. So it gets very slow, or it gets slower if you want to look for particular types or, well, do all kinds of inferencing. So what people do is they load data, and then they, they do all the inferences before they start doing queries. Yeah? So they do all the type inferences. So things that don't have a type, you try to figure out by inferencing what what the type is of a certain thing in the database, and then you add it as new triples. So in some cases, your 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 triple store might quadruple with all the inferences you can make, and then when you do your queries, your queries will be a lot faster. So it's sorry, I, I could have done that shorter. It's materializing I, the inferred information. Yeah. Okay. So good. thank you, Steve. It's a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> How is indexing done in a triple store? And what happens when stores are merged? How is triple indexing done? <sighs> yeah, it's um, actually in our documentation, we kind of describe, uh, so subjects have a, a subject predicate and an object. Let's talk, not, let's not talk about a quad store, but just about triples. Then you have three parts in triples, subject, predicate, object. And then what we have is uh, three orderings of, of three ways to sort our, our, our triples. So it is uh, by subject, predicate, object. It's by predicate, object, subject, and by object, subject, predicate. And with that, you can do any type of query. Um, but we use a sort merge approach for the indexing if that was the question. And then the other part of the question was? Well, what happens when stores are merged? Um, well, basically, you uh, well you can use federation between two triple stores. You never have to merge them. If you do merge them, you basically add one triple store to the other. So it's going to take a little bit of time to do that. But it is faster, because you don't have to do the whole string thing again. OK. And so? He's asking for suggestions for converting relational databases or, or text. 
uh, to a triple store. And then there's an example, for instance, what restrictions apply for handling text in languages like Portuguese, starting from transforming the text into triple stores? Uh, that's a whole bunch of questions in one. But um, so if you go to our website, you will find that about a month ago, I gave a talk about uh, how to apply entity extractors to text, to extract text out of a text and turn it into triples. So please go to our website and uh, you'll find a talk about that, where we explain that in, in detail. And how do you get triples out of a triple store? As our relational database, well, actually, um, we have one tool that we call RDB Mapper that will kind of do introspection of your relational database and come up with suggestions for how uh, they might look as triples. And as a human being, you have some choice in naming the predicates, in determining how you want to do joins between tables. Um, but actually, we're now working with someone who is using Talent, which is the open source competitor of Informatica. And he created an Allegro graph adapter to Talent. So now you can use a tool that many relational database people are familiar with and just create a mapping from relational database tables to triples and put it into the whole Talent architecture so that you get the whole ETL thing uh, kind of for free. Okay. And by the way, I expect that in one or two months we'll give a, a talk using these webinars to how we integrate with Talent. So what are the plans for version 4 of Allegro Graph um, running natively on Mac and Windows? Um, we currently have the VM. Yes. Um, so um, most of our effort at France right now, so we run Allegro Graph 4 on Linux, and we're focusing all our development efforts on getting to the Turian triples. Um, so Mac and Windows are definitely on our roadmap, but they've gotten a little bit on the wayside. Um, what you can do, by the way, and that's how I work a lot, even when I give my demos, but also for practical work, is you use um, VM, VMware on your Mac on, and, and or Windows, and you can run your triple store in the VM, um, but you can use your Python and Java interfaces just on your Mac or the Windows and talk to the uh, triple store in your VM, and that works beautifully. Has anyone used Legograph as a data store with Heroku or Google App Engine as a deployment platform? Uh, not that I kn know of. Okay. When I feel that, that. What are the different uses of Prolog and List in a Lego graph? Um, well, so actually, here you saw we uh, created a Sparkle query. If I click on Prolog, then uh, I can also if you look at my screen, then you can see that I also can turn um, the same visual screen into a prolog query. What we use prolog for is actually when you have rules. So if you want to do fairly complex um, analysis, then in many cases you have to write stored procedures because if you have to do everything on the client side, it gets inefficient. So we use prolog to, one, make abstractions. Um, on the on the server side, and then to use these abstractions in your queries, um, and get the the server server speed performance. Um, yeah. So I mean, some the, some people on in the audience might work with uh, Sparkle, and you know that uh, these Sparkle queries can get really really long. And when you do these long Sparkle queries, you sometimes see patterns in there where you say, well, this actually this set of five triples or graph patterns is actually just, say, an uncle relationship. And then the next one is just a, actually just a sibling relationship. But you have to use all the gra graph patterns all the time. In Prolog, you just define it all away. So Prolog queries are a lot, lot shorter. OK? 
Okay, I think we've gotten through the list of questions. Okay. Um, if anybody has any more questions, now is the time to type them in. Um, I will make a little advertisement. The, the new functionality that Jan's demonstrated in Gruff um, is available in the Gruff Lab, which is a new, new web page, Gruff Lab. We'll use that as a place to showcase things that aren't quite complete yet. And this one has, I guess it's not 100% Sparkle yet. Um, yes, yeah, so the tool that I showed you, um, the next thing we're working on is uh, that we can do optionals and block constructs, so like unions with multiple classes or optionals with multiple classes. Okay. But it's, as, as it stands, it's already a great tool to write the start of your Sparkle query and then do some hand editing if you want to add more. Again, so you can download the version of Gruff with that capability in it. Uh, it's just for 32-bit windows right now, but you can get it from the Gruff lab page. Okay. That, uh, oh, one more question. Uh, is there any difference between the performance characteristics of Sparkle queries and Prolog queries? Um, well, there sometimes is, but it's too complicated to talk about now. But um, for small queries, Sparkle is, is uh, sometimes faster. Uh, for complex reasoning, we have a slightly better query optimizer for Prolog. And we're working on the query optimizer for Sparkle to catch up with Prolog. Okay, that about wraps up the questions.